town They just won't understand How I have moved beyond We can't go back again Set out in Jesus' name Our lives have just begun To make the world a place Where the kingdom comes The kingdom comes We travel light and go To do the work of love So that the world may know The peace we're speaking of Set out in Jesus' name Our lives have just begun Until the world knows we carry Christ inside Set out in Jesus' name Our lives have just begun Good evening, and welcome to a service of scripture and song. I am Becky Smith. I'm a deacon here at Highland Baptist Church, and this is my first time on Facebook Live, and I've taken this opportunity to invite some of my family to join us for their first experience with Friday Church. They're coming from a horse farm in eastern Kentucky, an interstate down to Elizabethtown, all the way across the country to Oregon, and Wisconsin might even show up. Anyway, I'm thrilled to have you all with us tonight. I hope that everyone is holding up through this difficult time. It's a time like none of us have ever seen before, and a time when our strength and our faith is truly tested. Know that we are together. We will get through this, and we will be stronger on the other side. Okay, this is birthday week, 
and once a month we celebrate everybody's birthdays. And at this point, we know that there are three birthdays from uh, Wayside. Robert Allen, who has a birthday on May the 20th. Mike Byrne is also on May the 20th, a little bit different year. And Kiara Billups will also be celebrating uh, next week. So we have those three birthdays from Wayside. Now, if you are listening and you have a birthday this May, please put that into comments section and let us know about your birthday also. We want to celebrate all of those days. Normally, we have our prayer requests on the sheets that are passed uh, through the pews. Well, we can't do that now, but I encourage you to post your prayer request in the comments section of Facebook during this service. I will be compiling, Barb and I will be compiling together so that they can all be read at the end of the sermon. It's been 10 weeks since I've been able to worship in this building and I am thrilled to be back in this sanctuary Amen. that I have missed so much. Amen. Thankful to be in this place of God and to feel the grace of God and to see the face of God in this holy place. Since the beginning of our Facebook services, Debbie Lemon and Jeff Gray have been here to assist with the service and compile your prayer request. But Debbie's mother passed away earlier this week, somewhat unexpectedly. Our hearts and prayers go out to you, Debbie, and to all your family. Her mother had been ill, but this was still a surprise. And as I've felt two other times recently in this COVID disaster, I feel so empty inside because I don't know what to do to confront my, comfort my friends in their loss. But let's remember Debbie and Jeff and their families in our prayers. I believe Debbie and Jeff are watching. So I also have the privilege tonight to introduce Barbara Culvert to speak with you. She has been the chair of our Friday Church Ministry Group for several years and has done a really great job Amen. in representing us to the larger church community. Amen. She wants to have a few words with you tonight. So I won't tell you to turn off your phones because it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> Well, good evening, everyone. Um, <clears throat> it's with a little somewhat heavy heart that I'm here tonight. Um, perspective is what I've been asked to share a bit of. And certainly coming in tonight, I was taken by how quiet it is in here and how much I have missed the energy and the faces of the Friday Church congregation and the sharing and the hugs but we will get through this as Becky says and our governor says and we will get through this together um, I need to share with you something a little personal uh, it was very personal I'm going to be moving from Louisville to Bowling Green Kentucky the end of this month um, grandma is getting closer to the action down there I've got three growing up too fast grandchildren down there and I burned up I-65 last summer and I can't do it anymore. <laughs> so I am making a move and my son's going with me. Um, we're going to try Bowling Green and it's going to be a, a new adventure but I'm leaving so much here. My son brought me to Friday Church back in 2014 and Bill Dinwiddie also was part of that encouragement. And to my utter surprise, I joined this church. I felt upheld by it. And um, as my son worked his recovery from addiction, I worked my recovery and will continue to as an enabler, um, a rescuer someone who wants to fix, manage, and control. Uh, this congregation, this service has meant everything to me. It's, 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 I can't even begin to put it in the right words, but I was led here, I was upheld here, and I don't leave it behind. I'm going to stay in touch from Bowling Green. I will be sharing the services I would like to be active on the Facebook page, and I hope to join you all for Fifth Friday. Um, it is a challenging time for all of us, and 
I would leave you with the words of St. Teresa. Today, more than ever, we need to pray for the love, for the light to see the will of God, for the love to accept the will of God, and for the path to follow the will of God. Our Creator is holding us all up, and we continue to hold one another. And I'm taking you all with me, right here in my heart, and I love you all, and thank you for being part of my life of Friday Church. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Barbara. We're going to do as our first scripture and song um, this evening at Friday Church, uh, a passage from Psalm 66. So we'll sing and play together. This is a song that uh, many of you might know. Feel free to sing along at home if you want to. Sing. God is my strength, my strength. God is my song, my song. God is my saving grace. And I'm telling all the world, all of all majesty, God of eternity. My song. Here we go. God is my strength, my strength. God is my song, my song. God is my saving grace. And I'm telling all the world, God of all majesty, God of eternity, you are my song. From Psalm 66. All believers, come here and listen. Let me tell you what God did for me. I called out to him with my mouth. My tongue shaped the sounds of music. If I'd been cozy with evil, the Lord never would have listened. But he most surely did listen. He came on the double when he heard my prayer. Blessed be the God he turn a deaf ear, he stayed with me, loyal in his love. Sing it out. God is my strength, my strength. God is my song, my song. God is my saving grace. And I'm telling all the world, God of all majesty, God of eternity, you are my song. The Apostle Paul is one of the first preachers of the beginning of the church. He travels all over the known world and he visits all kinds of cultures. He finds himself early on in the process in Greece, Athens, the capital of Greece to be specific. I've been there. He goes to a place called Mars Hill. It's a big stone outcropping. It's the place where people met to discuss. He was there with people who are judges, justice officials and philosophers, and he's going to talk with them about Jesus. Here's what he says, standing on Mars Hill in front of all these people. Paul took his stand in the open space at the forum and laid it out for them. It's plain to see, you people of Athens, that you take your religion seriously. When I arrived here the other day, I was fascinated with all the religious shrines I came across. And then I found one. It was inscribed, To the God Nobody Knows. Well, I'm here to introduce you to that God, to this God that you can worship intelligently, 
so you'll know who you're dealing with. God of creation, all-powerful, all-wise, Lord of the universe, rich with surprise, maker, sustainer, and ruler of all. We are your children, you hear when we call. God of the ages, although time's troubled here, you are the one in whom history coheres. Nations and empires, your purpose fulfilled, moving in freedom, yet working your will. So Paul keeps on talking. Here's what he says. The God who made the world and everything in it, this master of sky and of land, God doesn't live in custom-made shrines or need the human race to run errands for him, to run errands for him as if he couldn't take care of himself. He makes the creatures. The creatures don't make him. Starting from scratch, he made the entire human race and made the earth hospitable with plenty of time and space for living so we could seek after God, and not just grope around in the dark, but actually find him. He doesn't play hide and seek with us. He's not remote, he's near. We live and move in him. We can't get away from him. One of your poets said it well. We're the God created. Well, if we're the God created, it doesn't make a lot of sense to think we could hire a sculptor to chisel a god out of stone for us, does it? God of redemption, of our rebirth, call out your church from the ends of the earth. Still you Savior, you put darkness to flight, overcome sin by salvation's pure light. So here's how Paul finishes up. This is, this is the close. He says, God overlooks it as long as we don't know any better. But that time, that time has passed. The unknown is now known. And he's calling for a radical life change. He set a day when the entire human race will be judged and everything will be set right. He's already appointed that judge and has confirmed him before everyone by raising him from the dead. All of your and so fast do for us now as you've done in the past yours is the kingdom your triumph we claim challenging evil in Jesus strong name God of our now all our trust is in you Covenant God, ever faithful and true, sovereign creator, redeemer and Lord, now and forever, your name be
Prayer means so much to us as believing Christians, and in Friday Church, we share our prayers with open hearts and minds, and we hope that you can post some online that you would like us to pray with you about. I know it can be hard. It's Facebook, and to put your prayers out on Facebook is risky. If you would like to, please do it. If not, hold silent prayer in your hearts and know that we're praying for you as well. Here is a prayer of confession that we can share together. If you would like, just take a deep breath and settle in, and we'll go into our silent time of God with first these words. Lord, we seek your truth with impatience and greedy curiosity, but God, your truth always seems to demand sacrifice as it sets us free. Forgive us for wanting easy answers that come with no cost and minimal change required. Clean our thinking, God. Tell us the good news again so that we might hear it as if it is the first time. God, we join you now in the silence that you may be with us in our prayer. Always be ready to witness to God's love and grace to anyone who wants to know about this hope that you speak of. Speak with gentleness and reverence, trusting that God's truth emerges not from your words, but from the Spirit at work through you. You are the face of God. I hold you in my heart. Live authentically from your true self. People may come after you, but your Christ-like ways will protect you from shame. In sharing God's love with others, we choose to suffer for doing good, trusting that God's presence goes before us and our foot will not slip. are the face of God. I hold you in my heart. You are a part of me. You are the face of God. You are the face of God. I hold you in my heart.
Our scripture reading tonight is from the Gospel of John. In the 14th chapter, it's part of the farewell speech. We talked about some of it last week. We're picking up again in the middle. At verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask, and I'm going to change the word father because we've always had trouble with that word because so many people have suffered because of fathers. I'm going to change it to compassionate creator. And I will ask the compassionate creator, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I'm coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in the compassionate creator and you in me and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me and those who love me will be loved by my compassionate creator. And I will love them and reveal myself to them. This is the word of the Lord. When I read those words, I will not leave you as orphans, my mind went immediately back to DeVue Park in Covington. If you Google DeVue Park, it will only come up as DeVue Park, Cincinnati. It's not in Cincinnati. It never has been. It's in Covington. It overlooks the Ohio River, which separates Cincinnati from Covington. It separates the state of Ohio from the state of Kentucky. It's a beautiful park. It's extremely hilly. And the roads are narrow. We went there quite often when I was growing up. My father, mother and father did not go to the same Bible study class. They didn't have classes for couples at that time. They were segregated. So whenever my, and it was always the same people going to the same place, but on Sunday morning they felt the need to segregate. We played a lot up there, and there's a place at the top of the park where the view is just fantastic. But there's another place there. And sometimes in order to turn around, because the the road was narrow and cars would be on both sides, my dad would just leave the park just a bit. He'd drive through these two gates and then turn the car around to go back. And whenever he did that, there's a a dormitory-like building off to the right. And when I, as a child, asked what that was, my parents said, it's the orphanage, very matter of fact. And then they explained to us what an orphanage was. And every time we were there, and sometimes when we weren't, I would think of that place. And it left me with a sense of foreboding, a sense of sadness, that constant reminder that I really could be without both parents. I didn't have words, I didn't have concepts for it, but I felt it. To be orphaned, to be out without support, to be without protection, to be alone, Afraid, grief-stricken, helpless, cut off from your origins. I knew nothing about the orphanage founding. I knew nothing about the philanthropist who was worried about the children on the streets of Cincinnati and Covington, left there by industrial accidents and pollutions and epidemics, and their compassion to start a place to save these children. I knew nothing of that. But I would say that the same things that give birth to orphans are still with us. Wars, disease, abandonment, cruelty, crime, neglect, holocaust, famines, pandemics, religious persecution. We still create orphans. And it can come at any age. Years ago now, when I was standing at the funeral home for my mother, my grandson, who was still young, I think first grade or second grade, he he doesn't have really a, a governor on his voice. It's one voice and it's loud. He always fills the room. He looked in the casket at my mother's body and he looked up at me and he said, where's your dad? And I said, well, Josh, my father died before you were born. 
And he took in that fact and chewed on it a couple of seconds. Then he looked up at me and he exclaimed in a voice that just lit up the whole funeral home, you ain't got no parents. Thank you for proclaiming to the world that I am now an orphan. But honestly, the orphan feeling didn't fit for me because I still had family. I still had those who loved me. I still had a church family. I had a work family. I have friends in my neighborhood. I was not bereft. Grieving, but not bereft. The first readers of John's gospel were in fact bereft and afraid and clinging by their fingernails to this newfound faith because all around them there are those who would take it away from them. And John writes a book of theology trying to summarize the faith and the basic truths by which they can live and he does it with stories and he does it with speeches and one of those speeches is this one, the farewell speech of Jesus. He's speaking to people who are afraid and confused and to them he says in their time of fear and confusion, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And it's fair to ask what commandments, because we're not talking the Ten Commandments. And if you read the Gospel of John, there's only one commandment, just one. And it's in this same speech, it's just a little bit later than what I read, where Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. This is my commandment, that you love one another. Brooke Baldwin was a CNN news anchor, she still is. She contracted the COVID-19 virus. She said for two weeks, it was like somebody gave her a beating. She said the worst part of that was at night. And she said she went to some truly dark places in her mind at night. The night's that time when you shut off the lights and everything's quiet and you're just left with your thoughts. And too sick and too full of pain to sleep. And she went to some dark places. And she and her husband tried to stay separate to protect his health. But she said of her husband, he could not not care for me. And he held her in those dark moments while she cried, constantly whispering encouragement to her. Now, I'm not suggesting we need to heal coronavirus by everybody hugging each other. That's crazy. I'm saying there's something healing about the connection and that love demands that we do the things. If we love, we act on that love. If we love, we act out the purpose of God, and that's the healing of hearts and souls. And the purpose of Jesus is to love everyone. I have a question, though, and I read this, that here's my commandment, you love everybody. Why such a difficult commandment? I don't know anybody who does it. I confess to you, I can love those around me, but the further you get away from me, the more difficult it becomes. And if someone has harmed me, or threatened me, or threatened harm to someone I love, it feels almost impossible. And for those first century readers, love those who threatened them, and there were plenty of those, love those who would abuse them, Love those who would take their heritage away from them, like kicking them out of the synagogue. Those who would make orphans of you. Love those. How in the world could Jesus expect that? Think of who's hurt you in your life. Somebody with authority over you, like a parent, teacher, doctor, a minister. Let a picture of that person float up in your mind. And I suspect the feeling that floats up with it is not love. But the beauty of this passage is that Jesus does not expect us to do this alone. He promises us the, the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the spirit of truth, the Holy One, enabling us to do loving beyond our capacity. Our temptation is to think of the Holy Spirit as some kind of a wispy apparition, like a fog in a cemetery. But I think more in terms of a, a sacred voice whispering challenging words, like, if you love God, you're going to love this person. Or if you love God, what does that love look like in reality? Or why are you being so judgmental? 
Or maybe the Spirit might hear me say, this is too hard. And the Spirit may whisper, well, here is my strength. We can do this together. Or maybe I am witness to some sort of miscarriage of justice. All you do is turn into the nightly news to see that. I mean, the Spirit may prompt me, what will you do about it? How will you use your voice? I think there's a tension here that the Spirit is deliberately creating, always questioning my intentions and my motives. Where's justice, Jim? Where's mercy, Jim? Where's understanding, Jim? Where's accountability? Where are you? And I think it's about our growth. We talk so much and we make faith seem as if we just do this one thing and suddenly we have arrived, but it's not really like that. We miss some of the understanding that was there. People would talk about, well, I got saved. Well, the, the language really is, I was saved, I am being saved, I shall be saved. I was made whole, I am being made whole, I shall be made whole. I was loved, I am loved, I shall be loved. I have loved, I am loving, I shall love even more. It's about growing. It's about this constant pilgrimage of faith, knowing we don't always get it right, knowing that we mess it up, but knowing that the Spirit keeps prompting us, keeps moving us along. We're always just a work in progress. I have to confess that when I read this passage a couple of times, I just started laughing out loud about the language. It seemed like everybody's abiding in God and Jesus and me and the Holy Spirit, and we're all abiding in each other. And it, you just want to say, what? I think it's a way of describing intimacy with God, a closeness, that real belonging that every orphan yearns for. It's a call to be aware of the sacred within you, like the book of Genesis, when it talks about being created, it talks about a little spark of the divine placed in each of us. And it's telling us that if we practice love, we know God. That in the doing, there is knowing. And in this place of fear and confusion and pandemic, Jesus reminds us of our purpose, to love. And he reminds us that this is the way that we truly connect with each other in acts of love. And ultimately, it is our healing because it connects us with God and with each other. Amen. Do we have our prayer requests? Prayer requests tonight include prayers for Debbie and for her family and the loss of her mother. A prayer to remove politics from the pandemic because our survival depends on surviving together. Prayers for Barbara and her son. A prayer of praise to God for sustaining me in the last three years as I worked through a difficult uh, seminary experience. By grace and miracles, I am graduating tomorrow. And that's from Allison Stabler. And I believe Allison won an award for being maybe the best Baptist at Presbyterian Seminary. I'm not sure what that was. <laughs> that's what applause sounds like when three people are six feet apart. <laughs> Prayers for those of us returning to work and those who are unemployed due to the pandemic and some are afraid of not finding work again uh, because the resources are running dry. Prayers for Edward B. Campbell recuperating from a broken hip. His wife, and Barbara, was a member at Highland Baptist. Prayers for all of those on the front lines as we battle this virus. Prayers for the homeless as they face the virus. And prayers for those who struggle with addiction 
which has been even harder during this time of isolation and social distancing. Prayers for the ways that we can be together, even in this sanctuary. And prayers for Barbara and Becky's support during tonight's service. I'm sure that's a prayer of thanksgiving uh, to comfort all of us online. In this place, there's quite enough love for one like me and for all of us and for everyone. And all I can say is well said, well said. Can we bow together for prayer, please? O Holy One, our minds are reminded that there are those that we will miss. And we don't have our usual ways of helping each other. We don't have the funerals or the visitation or the going away parties. And yet our hearts ache. So we pray for each other as we're separated. We ask for strength for courage and for comfort. For strength for those who wrestle with the addiction, with those demons, with those still caught in the madness. Give us the grace to survive. Give us the courage to keep loving. Love you and love ourselves and love others. I thank you for this time that we have together. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen.